So the first thing I wanted to do, uh, since so much of the story was kind of built around this uh, this unique idea for the for the world and the layout and everything, was uh, to set up the world itself. Um, you know, to uh, kind of lay some groundwork with that, um, and to set up around these cultural paradigm shifts, which had interested me so much. So kind of the two categories I wanted, I wanted cultures on a continuum, um, and I wanted uh, cultures that uh, were so completely separated from one another that they, that they might be completely unknown to each other, you know. So um, to go back to the history, and this is something which is, you know, really just mind-blowing to me, um, that you had the first encounter between European cultures and between North American, uh, like native North American cultures, um, that took place in Greenland in like a thousand years ago. That didn't take place, you know, with the with Columbus, you know. Uh, Greenlandic Inuits uh, had crossed over from Canada. Um, so, you know, the, those, those populations are, are, are they, they not only come from one another, but they are, you know, uh, the cultures of North America, which, which is spread out that way. Um, the, the Thule Inuits uh, from Canada, they crossed into Greenland around 1200. Um, and when they got there, so they came in from the north, which is also kind of crazy. Um, you would think that you take the most hard to reach island, uh, the most arctic, you know, one of the most arctic land masses in the world. Um, easiest way should be to come from the south, but no, they came from the north. <laughs> and um, uh, so they came around 1200 and they encountered a European society that, was, that had already been there for over 200 years. Okay, so, so think about this. So uh, Greenland is the only place where the current indigenous hunter-gatherer population, like up today, the current, the, 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 the current population today who are indigenous hunter-gatherers arrived there after European agriculturalists, okay? So if you think about, like, if you go to Greenland, you want to see ancient runes, like even today, if you want to go see ancient runes, and keep in mind, what I'm about to say has been true for the last 600 years, okay? Like, like this, is, this is not just like a phenomenon of today. This is something which has, has, has been there. You know, if you imagine 17th century Greenland, pre-Danish colonial period, um, and you're an Inuit polar bear hunter, um, you know, and you want to go see the ancient runes uh, of like the old people who used to live in Greenland, the ancient runes... Uh, are churches and farms and you know blacksmith shops you know uh, the ancient artifacts that you would find are things like iron swords and spear tips and you know woven wool cloth you know um, trinkets that are covered in Nordic rune and remember this is being found by hunter gatherers with you know no writing system you know um, it's it's uh, it's literally ancient runes of a more technologically advanced uh, ancient civilization, you know? So like, that's a fiction trope, you know, that, that is something, that's something that, that, that doesn't happen for real, but in Greenland it happened for real. You had hunter-gatherers, um, you know, who had heard whispers, you know, from their, from their uh, ancestors of this older people who did things like grow food from the ground and, and you know, like, uh, like, you know, herd sheep and, and work iron, you know, and they still have remnants of these that they still use. They still have fragments of iron that they, you know, that, that, that they, they, they found in, the, in these runes or was passed down for generations. You know, they can go back and they can see, like, the, the ancient advanced technology. You know, like, that's a crazy thing, you know. So, okay, so I wanted to start with this world with that phenomenon in mind of not just two different cultures, but different, uh, um, like, different cultures from different ages, you know. So, like, um, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Industrial Age, that are separated from each other, and the encounters skip those steps. You know, the the encounter between the Inuits and um, and the Icelandic, uh, you know, um, uh, people who had migrated to, to to Greenland. Those you know those uh, th those two cultures that was skipping the Bronze Age. You know, <laughs> like like it was it was the Stone Age people meeting Iron Age people. You know, and so I wanted to have that. I wanted to have cultures that are at varying stages of having encountered one another. So I, I, I wanted there to be situations where you had cultures who just don't know about each other at all. Um, I want to have some where they have completely misunderstood each other. Some where there's rumors, but they don't know if they truly exist. Um, those were kind of the cool, you know, the cool things that jumped out at me from learning this history. 
that I wanted to include. So um, as for the different types of cultures that I definitely wanted to include, definitely, you know, it was, um, I wanted in this, uh, in this tree world, I wanted a Western civilization analog, um, you know, in the temperate altitudes. Um, I wanted a Nordic civilization analog in the less temperate altitudes. And then I wanted like, you know, the, the indigenous, you know, like Inuit Sami uh, civilization analog in the extreme and inhospitable attitudes, okay? Um, altitudes, not altitudes. Um, and remember, this is, you know, this is along this, this uh, gigantic forest. Actually, at this time, I think I had, um, had already switched to um, having it be, instead of a giant forest, having it be a single tree. Um, and that switch was for the obvious reason of, uh, of um, uh, Yggdrasil, you know, the, uh, the, the world tree in Nordic mythology. Like, why not just, you know, just have it like that? But all these civilizations um, live on the branches of one tree, which is, you know, very, uh, um, very analogous to this, uh, to, to this thing from Norse mythology. Okay, so another point, uh, different forms of these cultures I wanted to include. Um, in the book Empire of the Summer Moon by S.C. Gwynn, um, uh, he makes this distinction um, with Native American tribes. Uh, between tribes that had very developed cultures um, by certain standards, right? So by the standards of religion, the arts, technology, cultural traditions, rituals, communal lore, um, stuff like that. And those that were by the same standard, less developed, um, you know, so people, these cultures who had no religion or extremely basic religion, um, nothing as far as arts or technology or history, you know, or very little, um, few traditions at all. And, uh, you know, he had... Um, he had kind of connected these, these, this later category to cultures that uh, tended to be more ruthless and violent. Uh, his book was about the Comanche, uh, who he had being in that second category, who were, you know, uh, he, he identified as having not much in the way of culture, but who were extremely warlike and, you know, extremely good at war. Um, and then the other category would be like the, 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 the Navajo, um, you know, who did have, you know, like, like, um, uh, you know, they were, they were um, very, very complex in all of these elements, you know. So those were the two categories of within that, um, that uh, like, non-Western civilization paradigm um, that I also wanted to include. Um, and then w as far as the inhospitable climates um, and altitudes, I realized I had a, a really cool opportunity. So I had, I had this tree with different, you know, um, and that's, that's where my, my different climates would come from. And uh, I realized that I could have inhospitable climates both at the high and at the low altitudes. Um, high altitudes would be cultures like the, the peoples who lived in the Arctic. And then low altitude culture is something which doesn't really, you know, there's no real equivalent of in this world, or at least, you know, um, none that I know of. People who live in absolute darkness, you know, this is, you know, keep in mind, this is, you know, miles and miles and miles of branches and then at the bottom it would almost be like a deep sea creature type uh, uh type type environment you know uh no sunlight gets through you know the canopy is 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 so complete that it it's it's just darkness all the time you know so no sunlight not not much in the way of vegetation maybe they would live off mushrooms uh insects you know um lots of filth uh lots of disease you know um, but the same phenomenon of inhospitable in terms of this is a, a you know, clearly impenetrable by what we think of as like modernity and civilization. Um, that there be, um, you know, but, but, you know, against, you know, against uh, modern uh, um, expectations, then, then uh, there's enough of these people that, they, you know, that, that found ways to live off of, the, of, of their own environment, to feed themselves and live sustainably in these, in, in these places, you know. Okay, so uh, with world building, um, I find that you need something systematic as a directive. Um, otherwise, it's just aimless and overwhelming. Um, so I like having some central problem um, that I can think of different ways to solve. Um, and, uh, you know, I can pick a directive like, you know, what do these different cultures eat? You know, or what kind of government do they have? Um, but I think it's much more interesting to pick something that comes from this unique setup of the broad world building elements, you know, um, of, of, of the world, you know, just so that it won't just end up coming from my own interest and in like, oh, I'd like to explore this type of, 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 of government, this type, you know, this, this type of, you know, like cuisine or dress or something like that. If it comes from the world itself, then, it, you know, then, then, then it's, it's going to develop much more uniquely. Or I, I should say, if it comes from a, a, 
a unique element in and of itself, assuming that the world that you've made is unique, then what comes from that, you know, is also going to have a flavor and feel like it it it, it belongs. It's going to feel more lived in in in, in that world. So uh, what I picked here, um, so I had a a, um, uh, a a vertical civilization, right? A vertical layout of civilizations. Um, and so what I picked as a directive, um, which led very naturally, eventually, into the uh, plot, uh, the development of the plot, the characters, um, was what these cultures did with the fallen. Okay, um, so vertical layout, cultures that live on branches, um, you know, and these branches are generally wide enough to be thoroughfares and town squares and stuff like that. Um, but it's still vertical and people still fall. Um, and when they fall, then they will fall through the whole tree, right? So um, uh, what are kind of the variety of different ways in which these cultures will navigate? Uh, you know, what happens when they come upon a person who's fallen? So I thought, um, okay, well, if people at the bottom, people have access to soil. Uh, I'd imagine that they would bury them, which is, you know, what, what we do living on our surface. Uh, you have people who could burn them. That struck me as something which is very fitting for like the Nordic analog. Um, also, you know, no access to uh, to soil. You know, kind of similar, I, I imagine, to um, what started that tradition in a lot of places, where you know, if, if you're living uh, on in like a rocky terrain or in an icy terrain, then you're not going to bury your dead. Um, also, you know, um, uh, burying your dead, you know. Um, was the assumption that they're going to decompose. People didn't always decompose in in, in the Arctic, you know, in, in, in the far north. I thought also you could have a segment of society uh, which deals with these people, um, either a higher class, maybe like a holy class who disposes of the dead, um, you know, with, with, with some kind of ritual, or uh, a lowest class, um, you know, who it would be like dirty work. Um, another possibility is that you could eat them, you know, uh, and another possibility is that you could also, you could study them. Um, and two of these options stuck out to me in particular. Um, the people at the bottom, uh, who lived in extremely harsh and, you know, an absolute, absolutely dark environment, uh, they would bury the dead who fell to the surface. Um, and as the people on the bottom level, then they would have, um, they would get the most bodies, basically. They would, they, they would have the most people falling down. More people, you know, everyone would reach them, right? But thinking from their perspective, they're at the bottom in total darkness, right? And they have no knowledge of the many cultures living above them. Um, and uh, you know, these are people who live in this uh, in this harsh environment where you're not going to have um, the the Western ways of thinking. Um, so in their animistic, ritualistic way of seeing the world, so they would see these fallen figures from odd clothes coming from nowhere, you know, coming from just the, the abyss above them. Um, and they have strange clothes, they have strange trinkets that they don't understand. Uh, maybe they would see them as fallen angels, okay, uh, which led to a more complete idea of who these people were, that this is a society of people, um, that um, they're, the, the society as a whole revolves around a religious duty to bury the fallen angels, okay. Um, then you had the people at the middle, people who live in the cultured, European-style, modern society, uh, who would study the bodies of the people that fell onto them. Um, but two things would limit the study. First of all, they are a modern civilization, uh, which limits how far they can stray from their comforts, right? Because that's how, you know, modern people are. Uh, that if something is too inhospitable, then, then they, they would not be inclined to go there. They would not be inclined to, to go see it for themselves, right? Um... It's uh, it's very convenient, kind of the setup that they have. That they can study, they can pretend that they're studying the entire world just from the comforts of their own altitude. Um, uh, so why actually venture out to these, you know, like really scary, harsh places and to interact with these scary, harsh, uncivilized barbarians? You know, so that's one limiting factor. The other limiting factor is obviously that they would only be able to study the cultures from above them, right? So um, only the ones from above would fall would fall to them, and they would have no way of accessing any of the cultures below them, any any knowledge of, of, of those cultures. And they might even deny that those cultures exist, you know, in, in kind of like a, a um, haughty, Western, closed-minded academic way, then they would say, oh, it's definitely impossible that you could have a whole society living in complete darkness. Um, and also, we have no evidence of them, um, you know, only because we never looked, you know, because of the first reason, but we have no evidence of them, so uh, why should we believe that they exist, right? 
so that was that was what led me into the ideas which ended up forming the main character and the main plot and that's what i'll talk about next time i just wanted to show something so that's where i was sitting oh i can't turn it on that's where i was sitting when i was filming this video um and i had my computer um on that bench and i was sitting in front of it um and uh it's in front of this cliff there's the view that you saw <laughs> so some some viking some little viking kid some brave viking king <laughs> you can see the path uh sledded down this extremely steep hill <laughs> which i think is awesome <laughs> like i was walking up and you know i saw i saw just like the uh um like you can see the lines of like those you know the, the grass and the weeds and stuff like that. i was like is that is that what that was and then you can see next to it, it's like, okay, the, the grass here is like up and then the grass here is matted, you know? And it's like, well, what happened? Someone clearly just was standing on that cliff and was like, I'm going to sled all the way down. <laughs> all the way down, like, you know, you can see like the road level down there. I don't know where it goes, but I just thought that was, that was amusing. <laughs>